transition pictures for Edgar Cayce, the famous clairvoyant, famous to everybody but me apparently, uh, famous clairvoyant who used to basically go into a trance, which was like the dream state, and while he was dreaming, he would come up with all these fantastical ideas, like predictions for things, and cures for diseases, and ideas for card games, and it would all come to him while he was in a trance. He had some famous clients like Marilyn Monroe, George Gershwin, Irving Berlin. He was very, very popular among the set who believed in clairvoyance. Skeptics, on the other hand, said, oh, come on. <laughs> Get out of it. But he kept on going, bless him, and did 14,000 readings or so in his lifetime. Then, because he worked so hard, he had a stroke in 1944 and died uh, in 1945. Wasn't expecting to die. Thought he would recover and be absolutely fine and then phew, suddenly gone. So I took a look at his pictures. When I went into the energy, there was this usual cave situation that I always see. The architecture tends to remain the same. It's people's reaction to it that varies. I stood around, waited. No sign of him. Then he just appears, almost like a performer appearing through a set of curtains onto a stage. Oh, hi everyone. Hi. I'm here. Except that he wasn't playing to an audience. He was looking in wonder at his environment. Wow. What is this? He thought that this was similar to his trance experiences that he'd had. This was a continuation. This was maybe a near-death experience. But it wasn't death. It was just another of his vivid dreams. Fell asleep in a chair. Oh, there you go. Look at that. Wow. Can't wait to tell this to the people back home when I wake up. And he walked around and thought, I need proof of this. I need to show people what I saw because this is amazing. And he started picking up pebbles off the ground. I'll take one of those. Oh, I'll take one of those. Oh, yeah. That'll show them. This'll prove to the skeptics that there's some truth to what I'm saying. Yeah. And he had an arm full of stuff. And he stood there and thought, now what else can I take? What else would they like to see? But as usual, there is a force to this. There is a current that they must concede to. Resisting genuinely is futile. You can hold back, but you have to give in eventually. And it was saying, put that stuff down there. You can't take it with you. So he lays it down and thinks, I'll be back for you. I won't be long. Just stay there. Great. I got proof. And he starts off up the tunnel, but not with a view to transitioning, with a view to just exploring, looking deeper into this world he'd found himself in, so that he could report back. Initially, he's very, very determined and very spunky and alert as he goes up this tunnel. But it goes on forever. On and on and on, climbing and climbing and climbing. And it wasn't that he had things to shed, even. It just felt like his enthusiasm. His expectations were being blunted, worn down. The way you take air out of a balloon. Just, come on, calm down. You're transitioning. You're not on vacation. This isn't a hike. But he still didn't get it. This was still a dream to him. A chance to prove that everything he said was true. At the top, he comes across the cave I always see, this metaphorical cave with the light in it, like a dome. Only, here's what's interesting about this particular transition. When people are great in this lifetime, 
when there's adulation surrounding what they do. They frequently arrive and find the cave is so big that it's intended deliberately by the universe to remind them that there is no greatness after we die. In Edgar Cayce's instance, he was enormous. And when he arrived in this cave, he had to duck down to get into it. It felt like the whole experience was smaller than him. Whereas the rest of us regard this transitioning thing as, as a huge deal. I guess he'd done so many crossovers, so many trances and so many readings that actually this was no big deal for him. He wasn't dwarfed by the environment. He was actually welcomed and embraced by it and was bigger than the environment. And as I followed him around, he walked around the dome and he was prodding the dome like you would a balloon full of water. Like, oh yeah, look at that. Wow. Poking at it. About now, he realized what had happened. After this long climb, which divested him of his belief at the time that actually he was still alive and just in a trance and whatever, that long climb had divested him of that belief. Uh-oh. This really is it, isn't it? Wow. And this is where we go. This is where we go. He was a deeply religious man. So I think this was perplexing to him. Probably at odds with his belief system, his script. But even so, he was curious, he was enthusiastic about it, he wanted to see where it went, he wanted to move on to the next stage. Okay, if I can't go back, I'm going to accept and embrace what is on offer here and see where the next step lies. And he leapt into the dome. Just threw himself at it, like he would be off a diving board or something. Into it. Went through it and sank down into it, and I watched him go. He vanished into the light. Here was a man who, despite ridicule, despite criticism, despite all the skepticism he endured, stayed true to the calling of his soul. And that's really hard to do. To be authentic to what you know on the inside is right for you, when the whole world around you Parents, teachers, preachers, friends, whatever, are saying, oh, come and do what we're doing. We'll give you money. It's easier. Come on, just conform. To follow your soul's path, that takes some doing. Skepticism, anyway, is a worthless currency. It has no value. All skepticism does is erect a wall between you and your personal growth. You and authenticity. You and your greater good. I mean, you have to be circumspect. Don't do daft things. Be prudent. Have some common sense in the way you deal with the world. But skepticism and cynicism are low consciousness pursuits. And I don't think they have any validity whatsoever. In science, in physics, they want proof first, and then they'll believe. In this world, in Edgar Cayce's world, it's believe first, then you'll get proof. Surrender first, then we'll show you the universe. You have to take that first step. You have to believe even though everybody around you is saying it's not true. And that's what Edgar Casey faced, his trap me.
Okay, that's it. Thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. Um, subscribe, like, share. Uh, follow me on Twitter if you like, at Cash Peters. Otherwise, I'll see you next time, guys. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.